Okay, I'll come back to you. All right, there's still people coming in. Yeah. But, uh, <coughs> okay.
I think we are set to make uh, a start. Um, so uh, my name's Nigel Healy. Uh, I'm from uh, Fiji National University, so this is a nice day out for me to come and see the opposition. Um, I've been, uh, been asked to, to chair the session today, and uh, we've got four different presentations on contemporary issues in the Fijian economy. For some reason, we don't have the price of carver as one of them, unfortunately, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, now, the way we're going to work this is that uh, each of our presenters has 15 minutes to give a presentation. So once we start, um, our, uh, the, the four of us who are, who are not presenting will just go and sit in the front row so we can actually uh, watch the presentation. Um, uh, Chris over here will do a drum roll at 13 minutes, so he'll, he'll just do a, a rather sort of discreet tap at 13 minutes and then a slightly more emphatic double tap, uh, as they say in the SAS, at uh, uh, 15 minutes. Okay, and so if you can wrap up w within a, a minute or so once you get the second one. So uh, we're gonna start then uh, looking at uh, the, the informal sector um, and uh, economic development, so particularly looking at uh, uh, exclus inclusiveness and gender equity. So. For this one, we've got Rukmini Gounder, who's a professor at Massey University. And I think if we'll, we'll start with you, and then uh, my colleagues, we can go and sit and watch. the case of uh, the uh, informal sector, uh, particularly this micro, small, medium enterprises, and also in terms of how we include the whole population within a sector which contributes largely to the economy. So the new buzzwords like inclusiveness and things are uh, becoming quite important, uh, particularly in terms of sustainable development goal, and I will look at some of that issue to combine that, but of course gender equity, some of these issues which you've been hearing from uh, yesterday itself, but I want to tie it with the tourism sector to see some of these uh, development goals, how they actually meet. Now, so why tourism sector? Tourism basically, of course, is a very important export sector, and so, of course, with foreign sector, uh, we talk about our foreign exchange earning, and we know that foreign exchange in, in earning is one of the most important uh, factors for our country's uh, uh, gross domestic product, or GDP, as everybody says. So tourism is important because tourism actually leads to the economic growth of the country. So is it tourism-led growth, or is it actually economic growth that leads to tourism growth? But the third point will be also the bi-directional relationship between tourism growth, which cont contributes to economic growth, but economic growth also contributes to tourism growth. So these are some of the things I think which are very important to analyze so that the governments or the sectors involved in tourism are particularly aware of what are some of the policy issues or the variables that explain this, which combines the overall contribution to the gross domestic product, gender equality, inclusiveness, and the rest of the sustainable development goal. So the hypothesis here is, I'm going to show you some empirical results of that, but I thought that given that we just had some very heavy and very nice lunch, 
Last night I was working on the slides. I had 17 slides and I brought it down to 12 given that I was told that I've only got 15 minutes to wrap up everything. So I thought, should I delete my uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation that showed all the models? And I thought, oh no, I better not. Given that it's going to be after lunch, by showing you the models, you will all wake up. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to show that just to give you an idea that whatever the results I'm presenting are not just made up story kind of thing, but actually explains these sort of aspects as well. So I'm going to look at government from the government perspective that does tourism actually lead to economic growth and how much it does contribute to the economy rather than the general perspective idea. But I'm also going to look at what happens in the case when there is a political instability, Asian financial crisis, global financial crisis, and then I'm going to link the tourism sector to some of the sustainable development goal, particularly more in terms of work, decent work for all. I mean, this is very important concept that we hear from the U United Nations Sustainable Development Goal that decent work, decent which we want that everybody to be part of the, our working employment structure of the economy. So I think tourism is one sector that can be part of that, but at the same time, how do we improve sustainable development goal? Now, I had a literature review slide, but I deleted that uh, just to tell you that there is this sort of work that has been done e elsewhere. But I want to show you how much it contributes to Fiji's gross domestic product in terms of direct contribution. Now, if you look at that Fiji's uh, direct contribution, it gives 14.4% in 2017, and that was the latest data I got. But if you look at by 2028, the reason that projection is done, because we, yesterday we have been hearing about the Agenda 30, which is a, uh, 2030, which is the Sustainable Development Goal. And that is the one where we say that, okay, by 2028, how much do we actually think the tourism sector is contributing to GDP? And 16.1. I think that is still not bad, so long as it has not declined. So I think it is still a sector where uh, we can initiate and we can put in more uh, resources to develop. Now, if you look at the total contribution to GDP, it's huge. It's almost 40% to 43% over the period of time. So that itself is a story by itself which tells the government what are some of the policies, or some of the resources, what are the things they need to think in the next 10, 15 years to, in, to make sure that we have this level of contribution as well. If you look at the direct employment, 13% of the contribution in terms of employment, and again estimated that it can uh, contribute to 16%, 16.5% of the total employment in the country. So when I talk about that inclusiveness and formal, informal sector, if we bring them into the formal sector, what would be then the contribution to the total employment? And I think this is something, again, we've got to work towards to bring the informal sector into formal sector. So that was the reason why the title talked about the informal sector as well. Now, if you look at total employment, if we can, if we are going to move from 36.5% to 44% almost, that again is a tremendous capturing of the labor for or the, the people who are ready to work and be part of the labor force. So I think that also is very important. And if you look at visitor exports, that's also important. So sustainable development goal plays a very important role. It can play if we are ready to meet some of those targets, particularly in terms of the tourism sector to meet various targets. They say actually, according to the United Nations uh, 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 World Tourism uh, Organization, the touri tourism industry is actually projected to dominate the economic activity with very high uh, arrivals. And they think actually, UNWTO thinks that tourism is one sector that can actually meet all the 17 sustainable development goals. Now that's magical if it can do, so I'm, I'm hoping that it, it can make a difference not just to the case of Fiji, but all the people uh, around, around the world as well, because we talk about developing countries, the least developed countries, and I think these are the ones that we got to make sure that we get our people out of poverty, good jobs, gender equality, clean water, sanitation, and particularly uh, consumption and, and produ production as well. So I think that's very important. Here are my models. I'm sure you all are wide awake by now. So. <laughs> I, I'm not going to discuss anything about it, but what I'm going to say, the first model, which uh, just shows the big 
general is that there is a general way of estimating the total value. But I'm saying we don't just rely on the total value, we must look at the actual fluctuations by monthly as well. Because we, can, we have got data, how many visitors arrive uh, uh, every, uh, every day and it's into months, and then also what is the industrial production of the country as well. So what I did, I measured it in terms of total spillover, directional spillover, and net spillover, and that will show you the fluctuations over a period of time of what are the contributions that can be linked to that. So I think that is very important. And within this, I've also wanted to show that what was the impact during the 1997 Asian financial cri crisis. Now that is important because Asia is our big market that comes. So did the tourist uh, uh, actually uh, arrivals decline? And if it did decline, what was the impact on the economy? That's important to measure what was the decline impact on the economy. And so, and I've also <laughs> taken into consideration the global financial crisis 2007 and 2008. And believe me, these are some very interesting models as well. And to make sure that my models are actually uh, clear uh, in terms of that, like any econometrician, we just phoned out on the data and make sure that the methodology is correct. So I've used the 48 month rolling spin windows and structural break, just to make sure the structural breaks come only because we see that the data is declining. So have we tested for that, that why tourists actually decline? So I've done all that to make sure that everything's uh, perfectly all right, not perfectly, but nearly perfectly all right uh, to explain that as well. Now, the first set of results I want to see, say is if you see 2.45%. Uh, now, overall for the period that I've studied, looking at 1991 month one to 90, uh, 2017 month six is the my data set monthly data. So there are more than 350 observations in there, which will tell you so, but when I do the general one, we say that, oh, total spillover is only 2.5%, uh, uh, but my, I'm saying that is not all the answer. We've got to understand there are some periods, it could be 10% or 2% or 5% or 16%. So this is what is the first step to give you an overview of that. And I, I won't explain most of the numbers, but all that 2.5 is estimated once I look at the industrial production relationship with the total uh, to, uh, international tourist arrival uh, in Fiji. Okay, this is my meaningful result which I want to tell you. I told you my data was from 1991, but because of the 48 month rolling spin that I have done to make sure that I extract the period from there, you can see that in 1996, our industrial production, the dark arrow key, uh, the dark arrow, unfortunately I forgot to bring my clipper uh, to show, highlight the lights in there to show that, but uh, you can see that industrial production is much higher. But if you see the dark gray, the dark gray shows, oh, is it the show? The red key here. Mm. Okay, Sunil, thank you, you're my savior here. Now you can see here, uh, this, is, this is deep and meaningful. I get excited when I talk about my results, you know. <laughs> I literally dream even when I'm sleeping, I look at my graphs and I dream. <laughs> okay, now you can see that, uh, okay, the, this is the period you can see it has started to decline and all that sort of thing, but that broken line is our tourism sector thing. But as it was declining, you can see that this was also the period of our political instability period as well. Not so much as that, but you can see the Asian financial crisis had a, has a big impact by reducing the industrial production from almost 15% to almost 1.50 or 1.6%. And similarly, the broken line, this one, which is the tourism, that even declined further. Now, these are the things if we don't capture, then it will tell us that we are not making sure that what, do we, what does the government do in terms of the policy implications sort of thing. So that is the reason why using of monthly data sort of explains quite a lot. And you can see the fluctuations over a period of time. Again, we had another coup and sort of things like that. And you can see as soon as the coup takes place, sort of slightly the, uh, the uh, tourist arrival do tend to decline as well. But 2001, I did try to picture this one. Now 2001, 
we had actually the U.S. recession. Now, if U.S. has a recession, most of the tourists, and, and, and a few years ago I was in the United States, and somebody asked me, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Fiji. And he said, is that in Africa? So I said, well, I'm looking almost like an African now. But uh, nevertheless, I said it's in the South Pacific Island. So then I quickly switched on my computer and just made sure that he knew where Fiji was, and I invited him to come to Fiji as a tourist first. And then he got really excited. He said, okay, I'm going to do that because it is some, something blue waters, blue sky, lots of tropical fruits, and you can swim in the morning and in the evening as well. So these are the things that can tell us quite a bit about that. So I, what I did, I kept looking at that, and you can see in the 2007, 2008, you can see there's a slight dip as well. Now, when we look at these dips, you can actually measure in here what was the actual contribution of tourism to the economy. And if you look at in here, you can see after 2011 or almost something like that, it is the economy was boosted more from the tourism sector rather than the industrial production of the economy as well. So I, I won't spend any time on this because I already had one of the lolly beats here. for the women as well. So it gives us a story. What about gender equality? Where are we going towards that? So I think decent work, bringing the informal sector into the formal sector is very important. Fiji needs the net, has that net, good net spillover impact on the economy, but what about the vulnerability of to, uh, uh, the, the tourism industry because of the shocks? Uh, these are the economic shocks externally induced, and this is the political instability as well. Now, Fiji has tourism plans, and then these are all up there on the system, and, and they have got some very good policies which needs to be done as well. So uh, what is the impact, I think, to bring the social uh, industry in there? We have to emphasize on the small, micro, small, medium enterprises. Pardon me, I don't have the time. I would have loved to have talked this out somehow, but I can't. So I also inclusion of informal sector into the formal sector and also reducing inequality, bringing the woman gender into the whole program. I had lo a lot of information about the woman employment sector in here. Unfortunately, I won't be able to uh, present to you that, but during the question and answers or, uh, or during the afternoon tea, we can do that. And I think women's most, the women in most sectors are largely concentrated in low skill and also low paid jobs without health, safety, labor right protection. And I would uh, make, uh, like to see the government looking at some of those policies which brings them to gender equality issue as well. And so youth employment, again, I have quite a bit of data and information, but I want to make sure that uh, training, skill development, school dropouts are given that opportunity to be part of the, that uh, sector as well and not just become local transport providers or food stores, shoe shine, or all of that sort of thing, but job opportunities in the wage sector is important. So that's important as well. And these are some of the future uh, uh, agenda strategies ahead in terms of meeting the 2030 uh, development, uh, 2030 agenda but I won't touch on to this at all in terms of, apart from saying that small and medium micro enterprises are important, gender issues are important. Uh, similarly, youth in the employment sector has to be included. And the last thing that I want the government to also recognize is that if foreign aid is coming into the country, into the small, medium micro enterprises or any form of aid for trade that is coming, it should be beneficial for the country, for the recipient, not in terms of the donor interest as well. 
Once again, I've done a lot of work in this area as well. So thank you very much, Vinaka Bakalevu, and I look forward to taking your questions and answers. Thanks, Rumani. Um, so if you were falling asleep after lunch, hopefully her energy woke you up again. Um, but clearly, Chris, you're going to have to hit that harder. <laughs> I think her, her energy overdid it for you. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is we'll, we'll take uh, the Q&A for all four panelists at the end. Um, and uh, we'll go now to uh, uh, Sunil Kumar's uh, presentation. Uh, he's a senior lecturer here at uh, USP. And he's going to be looking at the question of whether the uh, growth story contradicts a reality on the ground. So, Sunil, over to you. All right. <coughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just hit the road. I think no introduction is needed. Uh, the, the issue is, does Fiji's growth story contradict with reality on the ground? A business per perspective. I have done a small survey in this uh, research. I'm going to bring it out at the end uh, of the uh, story that I have to tell. Uh, that's the kind of roadmap of my presentation, a brief introduction. Uh, then I'll talk about GDP growth trends uh, fundamentals of the economy, uh, what does our survey tell us, and uh, some policy questions and uh, conclusions. <coughs> uh, the key point that I want to make here really is uh, to say that the government's projection on economic growth has been quite indecent. All right, <coughs> economic growth rate for the past and the future projections, uh, it's around 3.5, 3.5% in real terms. And that is what has happened over the last 10 years. During the earlier 10 years, the economy grew at about 2.5, 1% point less. <coughs> uh, and, and then it was growing, the economy was growing erratically, uh, frequently getting into negative. Uh, we would also intend to establish what the future growth is. The current government's claim on economic growth, however, has been quite hefty and unrealistic. This is the main point of my presentation this afternoon. The government has been making claims such as unprecedented growth in the last 10 years. Fair enough. Economic boom. Fair enough. Now, Banimarama boom. And claims have been made, economy doubled in the last 10 years, uh, added 100,000 new jobs in the past 10 years. So statements such as Banimarama boom, doubling of the economy and 100,000 new jobs, I need to be contested. And that's what I'm going to do here. This is what the statement was uh, from the Minister for Economy uh, a few weeks back. Since 2009, the Banimarama boom has more than doubled the size of our economy. A boom in employment has uh, put a hundred thousand uh, more Fijians in jobs, hundred thousand more women and men who can go to work, earn a paycheck, and provide for their families, driving uh, national um, unemployment to a 20-year low of 4.5%. And a booming private sector investment has built new homes, hotels, offices, residential buildings, and shopping centers while historic, historic public spending has built a national network of high quality infrastructure and reliable essential services. Huge exaggeration. Yeah, let's look at the economy. This is what the Asian development data tells us. You can figure out over here, 2.2, uh, uh, sorry, 3.2, 3.5. Uh, growth, okay? Um, uh, that, that was reported in uh, Pacific Monitor, May 2019. This is what the uh, 
immediate past and future, uh, immediate future projections are, all right? And also it is giving some data on agriculture industry and so on. So it's sticking at around 3.5%. Uh, these are some of my calculations, all right? Uh, using Bureau of States data. And uh, if you look at it, the growth from 2008 to 2018, using the figures tells me, tells us that the overall economy grew by around 36% on the upper side, okay? Now, so you can figure out now where the exaggeration is. If the economy had doubled, it, it would mean 100% growth rate, all right? So I have, I have uh, done these calculations and also uh, using the current prices. And when I use current prices, uh, Bureau of Sets data, it tells me 92% on dollar basis, okay? Without adjustment of inflation, okay? So, then I did some calculations, uh, very basic, uh, you know, economic calculations. Uh, uh, the economy should know. If the economy had to double in 10 years, it must grow at 7.2% for a nearly 100% growth, right? So, I guess you can already figure out where the exaggeration is in the minister's statement. Why the minister's statement is so important out here is because he speaks to the whole nation. And this is a bluff. And I think the truth has to be brought out. So I chose to bring it out in this international forum. I've already done an article on this uh, in one of the dailies. Okay, what is, the, what, what is happening to the fundamentals? The first two sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, obviously on the kind of declining phase. Retail whole sector is almost stagnant because, uh, because consumption is declining at the moment. Uh, transport se uh, sector is out there as well. Financial sector is on the verge of declining. Um, communication IT out there, same. Very little growth is expected. Tourism and restaurant is edging up, but very slowly. Uh, health services education is basically in you know, our public sector. Um, the, the budget this year expenditure has declined by a billion, which is about 25 or 23, 25 cents of the overall expenditure last year, okay? Or planned expenditure last year. Okay, government administration uh, and the security services would be out there about uh, two, three percent, maybe also decline. Efficiency and productivity, stagnant at best. Is the poverty declining? Yes, because the economy grew over the last 10 years. Uh, yes, it has declined by about three percent. Is employment increasing or decreasing? Uh, I think at the moment it is decle uh, decreasing, which means unemployment is rising. Trade balance widening. And the main problem there is exports declining. Okay, I just wanted to show you some data on employment. This is the government budget supplement data which was presented uh, a few weeks ago when the, when the budget came out. And you can see the kind of, uh, you know, hilarious figures given here. These are coming out only because the change in classification, okay? So uh, you can see from 2.7 thousand, which is 2,700 to 62,800. And similar kind of you know, changes are shown here, big ones, which is showing the total change of huge 136%. Now, this has to be rationalized. And I just wonder whether the minister was going to justify his argument on, on this basis. Okay, so 126% uh, increase in, in just one year. No, that, uh, that doesn't make sense. All right, my calculations using Bureau of Stats data, and I think it's authentic data. It shows that uh, over the last, uh, over the last 10 years, around 10 years, 2009 to 2016, employment grew by about 36.4%. All right, that's more realistic and it reflects the economic growth over the period. 
Is the quality of government services improving? Uh, I have my doubts, given the decline in the uh, uh, plan budget budgetary expenditure. So I think it will deteriorate. Health sector is in a mess already. Education is going through serious trouble. Uh, I don't think there's enough work being done there to actually, you know, review the you know, curriculum and all that and fine tune the, uh, you know, the education uh, towards the industries and all that. It's not happening. I think they are not even happening at the university level so much. And Professor Nigel might want to verify that. I'm not too sure. Okay, so what does the business survey tell us? My goodness, look at this. This is the World Bank data, not mine, all right? It shows, actually TJ's you know, uh, uh, rating has declined terribly. Uh, you, you see this, uh, this is doing business. Uh, um, about 10 years ago, it was at about, or maybe five years ago, it was at about 75 to 78, somewhere between there. It has fallen, now it has gone down. Our ranking is now exceeded 100. All right, so it, it, it has gotten worse. Same applies to starting a new business uh, ranking. It has worsened terribly. We have gone down from about 70 something or 80 something to 161. Horrible, and you, if you want to really figure that out, go talk to some businesses, they'll tell you. Getting electricity is even worse than uh, in PNG. I know it's about it's about the kind of conditions that are being set, the kind of time it takes, the kind of running it takes for businesses to actually get those kinds of things done. All right. So I have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, getting credit. And I say here, the reason for abolishing data bureau remains a mystery. There used to be a data bureau here. You know, all those guys who were taking, you know, loans, uh, buying things on, you know, kind of credit. Those were all recorded in data bureau. And anyone going to the bank would have, you know, the bank would have easy access to know where the standing was. And loans would be much easier. Today, people are not getting, small businesses are not getting loans. People are not getting loans because uh, because it's very hard for banks to verify their you know, credit standing. Why it happened? Really, there's no explanation, almost no explanation. Um, it baffles you know, some thinking people. And I don't think we can seek answers. <coughs> so we are at 161 ranking at the moment on, on, that, on that front. Overall rating has worsened in the last five years significantly. What our survey tells us, we did a survey of about 26, uh, uh, 26 businesses, small ones, you know, like faders, like, uh, you know, hairdressers, like that. And this is the kind of answer they gave us. 20 out of 25, the businesses, uh, they said they were either doing bad or very bad. So 80% said they were in trouble. Uh, on why, uh, they, their uh, business were bad or very bad. 21 out of 25, which is 84% of them said either, their business costs were too high or that their businesses were low, that demand wasn't there, okay? Issues such as taxes were too, uh, taxes were too high and compliance costs were too high uh, uh, featured in our, in our findings. On asking what the government should do, uh, to help them, 20 out of 25 businesses either said increase tourists because Nandi is a tourist town. I did my survey in Nandi. All right. So, uh, that knock put me off. <laughs> 20, 23 out of 25, that is 92% of the businesses said they would like to invest. So, the people want to invest. But I think they are constrained by the kind of the kind of uh, policies, the kind of constraints that are there in terms of establishing businesses. So, uh, and of course, 100% uh, of them, surprisingly 100% of them said they were very happy or happy or okay with their workers. 
That means they, they could, they could uh, kind of uh, develop skills amongst their workers or were close to them. Because it was small uh, business, maybe they were close to the workers as family members or something. So this has to be, this has to be found out. This has to be investigated through a bigger, through a bigger survey. All right, concluding remarks, the same things I had said five years ago, and it holds true even today. The government must pay attention to energizing the productive sectors through private sector initiatives. Long-term strategies uh, need to be considered to enhance productivity or productive resources. Labor market issues are serious, long-term problems which need government attention. The business environment needs to be improved. There has to be solid you know, steps taken towards it. Approval procedures and so on uh, needs to be uh, looked at by the government. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. And I go. Thank you very much, uh, Sunil. And I uh, wouldn't recommend you apply for a job with Investment Fiji anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, that very provocative uh, presentation, I think it's raised a number of questions. And I think uh, our next presentation uh, from uh, uh, Janesh Sami, who's uh, also uh, a lecturer here at USP, uh, it's quite a nice segue into this because, of course, the, uh, the spending cuts that were announced in the budget were uh, triggered by a slowdown in the economy and the particularly in tax take. Um, so uh, we'll try and unpack that a little bit further in this next presentation. Janesh. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm quite happy to be here to talk about uh, public debt uh, in light of the recent debates that we have been having in Fiji, um, if you look at uh, the current landscape, economic landscape in Fiji, there are two issues that seems to have attracted a lot of attention. One of them being the impact of public debt on economic growth, and the other one being whether the, the fiscal position of the government is sustainable. Um, so what I'm going to do in this presentation, I'm going to present some results based on some research that has recently happened at School of Economics. And I'm also going to talk about the 2019-20 budget as to what this actually means. If you look at the, the, the recent developments following the global financial crisis, countries had to spend a lot in order to avoid residing into uh, recession. And that actually led to rise in the public debt. Now, public debt can have, a sustain, unsustainable public debt can have uh, significant implications for conduct of macroeconomic policy and as well as financial markets. Um, so it's very important that the government carefully monitors uh, public debt. Now, we have had similar discussions in Fiji after 2006, okay? The, the expansionary fiscal policy stance as well as the rapid rise in public debt has triggered a similar debate among academic and scholars as to what is happening to public debt? What does this mean for economic growth? Whether fiscal position of uh, Fiji's economy is actually sustainable or not? Now, first of all, I'm going to look at the, the recent trend, okay? Now, the rise in public debt is, is not a recent phenomenon, first of all. If you look at historical data from 1970 onwards, okay, the historical data tells you that public debt has increased after independence, and that's quite justifiable because after independence, the economy starts to spend a lot on infrastructure. Now, there was also an also increase, a sh far sharp increase in public debt after 2000. In fact, if you look at the rise in public debt after 2006, that was less significant compared to what was after 2000. Right? If you look at the recent data from 2009 onwards, what appears to be the case is that the, the level of public debt as percentage of GDP has somewhat declined, okay? And in fact, uh, if you look at the period 2014 onwards, the government has successfully managed to reduce the, the public debt below 50%. Now, this, I think, 
is because the government is uh, slowly starting to realize it cannot continue to spend excessively. That's where it's coming from. And even the 2019 and 20 budget is not a surprising budget because the government is now starting to feel that it cannot continue to spend excessively as it did after 2006. Now, another important point here is that much of our debt is domestic, which is a good news. If you look at our share of external debt, it's well below 15%. And the government currently targets a 70%, 30% ratio, domestic to external. So the good thing here is that our share of external debt, which has increased in recent years, is still quite low. And I think the government should exercise caution uh, when it comes to foreign borrowing, because when you borrow a lot from abroad, it actually makes our economy more vulnerable and restricts to our ability to respond with appropriate policies. So there are some arguments in the literature as to how public debt might actually have a negative impact on growth, and these essentially operate towards uh, savings and investment. And I'd like to point out the second argument. Higher public debt necessitates expenditure cuts. Sooner or later, the government will have to cut expenditure or come up with taxes. When you start coming up with new forms of taxes, it can have distortionary impact, okay? So you can start spending, but there comes a point where you have to come up with additional sources of revenue, okay? Um, the other important point, which is quite important in context of Fiji and especially developing economies in the Pacific region is that when you have high levels of public debt, it restricts your ability to respond if there's any adverse external developments let's say, uh, decline in remittances, uh, decline in vista arrivals, and, and so on. Because you have high levels of public debt, there's a restraint. So I think this, uh, the third argument is quite in, uh, important for Fiji and other Pacific Island countries. Now, this is based on a recent study that I completed with uh, Dr. Nilesh Gounder. And if you're interested in the methodological and theoretical framework, you may please visit the School of Economics Working Paper website where I've described the methodology and the theoretical frameworks in more detail. I'm just going to present you the main result, okay? The main thing that we want to find out here is how does public debt influences economic growth, okay? The main I idea that we get here is that empirical analysis suggests that higher levels of public debt has a negative impact on economic growth. That happens in the long run and in the short run. Now, we did additional robustness checks to include additional control variables, alternative sample period, controlling for nonlinearity, and we find robust. So there is robust evidence in context of Fiji that higher levels of public debt will have a negative impact on growth. Okay? So I think in that sense, the government is right towards the expenditure cuts that has been just announced recently. Okay? because higher levels of public debt will constrain our ability to achieve higher growth rates. Now, the second debate that we have been having in Fiji is regarding sustainability of a budget debt sheet or public debt, if you like. Now, I would like to point out that sustainability is a very difficult concept to define, okay? And there are different methodologies available in the literature, and in fact, the way International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and Liza sustainability is somewhat different from the approach that academics approach sustainability. So we have uh, problems in terms of what actually meant, uh, meant by sustainability and what should be the ideal methodological approach. Now, we can be stuck with that kind of theoretical debate or we can still talk about it. And I'm of the view that every approach is informative, provided you approach it with a cautious way. Now, what I did is um, looking at data from 1970 to 2018, when you analyze the, the, the expenditure and revenue pattern, what we find is that the, the, the budget position is sustainable, okay? Now, having said that, okay, the estimated slope coefficient is close to one, okay? But this doesn't mean we have to be too happy about it. It is sustainable, but things can go wrong very easily, okay? If the share of external debt increases, okay, 
if oil shocks become too negative, okay? If you have a negative oil shock, okay? If you have a global slowdown, okay? So there are certain developments that can quickly make things unsustainable. So we have to accept this result in a very careful way. It is sustainable now, but this doesn't mean the government can now start spending excessively the areas, okay? This is informative in sense, in the current position is sustainable, but should the external developments be not so positive, okay? The government may find it difficult. And that is the case not only for Fiji, but for the other Pasuaran countries, because we tend to be affected by so many external developments, okay? And that is something that needs to be considered as well. Right, so if there's, uh, let's say, uh, oil shock, sudden rise in the oil price because of some uh, political or economic problems across the board uh, in the in Middle Eastern countries. Uh, let's say uh, we have problems getting a higher sugar price, global slowdown, or let's say Cyclone Winston, something like Cyclone Winston. Okay, Cyclone Winston, for instance, wiped out about one third of our GDP, costing around 500 million. Okay, so given that we accept the fact that we are going to be affected by climate change, okay? And if you look at 2016, okay? Following the cyclone in 2016, that had a clear impact on the expenditure pattern of the government, okay? So it is sustainable now, okay? If we have a new, if you have a cyclone or some other kind of a natural disaster, okay? it can have a serious implications on the government's ability to respond. So it is sustainable now, but the government has to be careful about its spending. Sustainable, but it, is, it has to be considered very carefully by the government, right? So I think fiscal reforms are also important because we want to avoid distortionary taxation, okay? And that is something very important because we need to make, uh, investment are priority. Uh, the, in the current budget, the government is trying to review the Investment Act, which is a good step, but we need to do more to improve the cost of doing business, okay? And as, as my colleague has pointed out, we need to do more to attract more businesses, okay? I, reducing the amount of compliance and, and so on. I, I another point I want to point out here is we need to reduce our vulnerability to uh, adverse external developments. Okay, there are a lot of things that are happening outside the, the, the Fijian waters that actually has an impact on what happens to our economy. Okay, for instance, the, the, the trade dispute between US and China, okay, that's probably going to affect uh, our trading partners, affect us through visitors and remittances, okay. So we need to be careful in terms of looking at our fiscal policy. And what it calls for in the long run is a smarter budget. I'll come to that in a while, right? So I think the 2019 and 20 budget is a commendable budget given it's focusing on the environment and sustainability, okay? So it's intending to bring the, the budget deficit from 3.5% to around 2.7%, which is good. And I think slowly the government is starting to realize that it cannot continue to spend and spend and spend. Eventually it has to reduce. Okay, and in certain areas where the expenditure cuts have been announced, okay, actually supports this, um, this hypothesis. Um, there's some good things in this budget and I think the review of Investment Act, okay, uh, in particular digitization of government services, these things were long overdue, okay. We need to increase the amount of private sector investment in Fiji, okay, by improving the practices in Fiji, okay. Things such as how many days it takes us to start a new business, okay? Number of procedures that the businesses have to comply, okay? So the government needs to consider all these things, okay? Um, to ensure that we're able to attract private investment. Unfortunately, if you look at the data that's available from Bureau of Stats, you don't see private investment data. I don't know, for some reason, the government is now providing private investment with public enterprises. It's very disturbing. You can't really follow what's happening to private investment. And that is one thing that we want to look at, what is happening to a private investment. If the government is making so many changes, the government should provide okay, to the, 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 uh, the, the citizens uh, 
the scholars, okay? What is happening to private investment? Private investment should be separate from investment by public enterprises. So what we know is what is happening to private investment. Right, the main point that I want to make today is what's happening to the, the sugar industry. The government has merely increased the allocation by $8 million compared to the previous financial year, okay? So we have an industry that is, is not in a good shape and that is directly coming from the annual report of PG Sugar Corporation. If you look at 2018 PG Sugar Corporation report, majority of the indicators indicates that we have not made significant turnaround in the performance. So $8 million additional allocation compared to previous period is not going to shift the sugar industry towards a better performance. It's not enough. Okay. Um, again, a good thing there is that the government is trying to investigate the, the $200 million loss by FSC. Okay. So we need similar kinds of uh, investigations for other enterprises where governments have the government has a stake, okay? We need to investigate losses by state-owned enterprises, okay? Another thing that I want to point out is the review of Financial Management Act, and that is basically going to ensure, to a large extent, transparency and accountability, okay? So there are some good things in the budget, and there are some bad things in the budget. You can't, you can't have a budget that's going to be good on all ends, right? But there are certain areas that the government, I think, needs to look at, and one is sugar industry. So we need to strengthen fiscal transparency. Uh, one of the things important here is asking for publishing of the audited reports, okay? Um, we also need to review the expenditure plans. The government is spending a lot more money in certain areas such as roads, health, education, and so forth. And it's about time the government starts evaluating whether these spending is actually generating value for the taxpayers. Um, so two major findings here is that public debt has negative impact on economic growth, okay? That's directly based on the data analysis. The fiscal position is sustainable, but the government must be cautious about external developments, what's happening to oil price, uh, sugar price, um, as, as well as what's happening to the global economy as well. So if we come up with a smarter prudent, uh, prudent budget, that will provide the government the opportunity to maintain fiscal sustainability, build investor confidence, provide fiscal space so we can respond to adverse external shocks. Okay. Improve sectorial growth. There are certain sectors that are not doing so well. Okay. So coming up with a smarter budget will provide the ability for the government to actually support these sectors. We don't have all the sectors of the economy are not doing well. There are certain sectors that are only doing well. So we need to increase, okay, increase the contribution of the other sectors as well. So with a much lower growth rate projected for 2019 and 2021, okay, that's based on what the Reserve Bank of Fiji is saying, uh, the time is right for the government to initiate fiscal reforms and we need to have a smarter budget and the government needs to really think hard uh, make the state-owned enterprises more efficient, okay? Uh, and it requires the government to really look at fiscal policy, okay? Because um, public debt will have an active impact on growth. Ideally, we want to maintain the growth rate, okay? Now, if you look at uh, the, the, the growth rate from 2013, the average from 2013 to 17, that's uh, based on a five-year period, okay? That's around 4.6. If you take 10 years or 15 years, that might be a different thing, but I'm just looking at average of past five years. That's 4.6. That's quite impressive, but we need to maintain that. We need to maintain that for a prolonged period in order to see any significant benefits coming for the ordinary Fijians. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janish. Um, and uh, you made a number of uh, very interesting points there. I mean, one of them is the, the need for the government to have uh, headroom, fiscal headroom, to respond to external shocks. 
Um, and of course, one of the things that we do face is the increased uh, risk from climate change, um, both of cyclones and, uh, and other uh, events. So uh, we're now going to do something rather unusual in a scientific conference. We're going to actually talk to somebody in the real world, um, <laughs> which doesn't happen very often. But we talk a lot about the impact of climate change on farming and agriculture. So we're lucky to have today uh, Adish Nadu, who is actually himself a farmer. How can you see my chocolate? farmer but I use Apple platform because <laughs> unlike universities they still stuck into Microsoft. In the last two days I went to two lectures. One was last night. I think Professor Beeman took me. I thought it was interesting. It was by Professor Vinod Mishra. He talked about litra, literature and poem and all that. Nothing of that lecture got into my uh, head. I just couldn't understand a thing about literature in 1800s and all that. Second was today, I had no idea what was being talked about because <laughs> we don't worry about economy, we just go on planting and supplying food for the people. Anyway, my name is Adish Naidu. I'm an, uh, actually, I'm an architect, uh, just to uh, let you know. I've designed a few significant buildings here. The last one was the Grand Pacific Hotel, the income tax building in Suva, Tapu City, MACC, and few resorts and all that. Finally, I decided I had enough. I've got no more inspiration from living in Suva. I thought I'd go farming. And my colleagues were happy because it meant less competition for them because I used to win most of the design competitions and win a lot of awards. But then they asked me why into farming my reply to them on at least the plants don't talk back to you <laughs> because in a real world the clients will have all sorts of complaints and you know what not the color is wrong the dough is jamming and you know you didn't put the toilet in the right place and all that sort of shit <laughs> so so i thought i go into farming and then when i went into farming i chose the most difficult vegetable to grow and that was tomatoes so this morning i if I can find it. Right. It's called Yellow Farm. And uh, so when I went into farming, I had no idea. I first grew as a farming background. But I chose um, tomatoes. So I, I thought to myself, there must be an easier way of uh, growing tomatoes. So I thought I don't have to spend days in the sun and getting darker than what I am now. So I thought I, I plant in a greenhouse so I can plant in uh, you know, a controlled climate. Um, that was true. But then later on, I found out that uh, tomatoes has, have a lot of issues with different types of diseases. Then I thought, well, there must be another way of growing. But the first lot of tomatoes I grew came out very well because uh, uh, I irrigated it and, and produced a lot of uh, tomatoes like this and has ended up having to uh, put is uh, we having to put ladders to harvest tomatoes and uh, produce tomatoes like this uh, and then we had to make some bures for the staff. These are some of the things we do at uh, the farm. And we also catch fish <laughs> for livelihood because you know I, I didn't realize the value of a dollar until I went farming because in my practice, we used to issue invoices of 300,000, 100,000, 500,000, and suddenly you're in a farm. A $2 bundle of uh, cabbage when you sell it, $2 looks a lot of money. 
So you start to make sure that you live well within the means. And then I tried uh, going into another system using stones, planting tomatoes in stones. It is called a Dutch bucket system, where you have uh, you know buckets in a row with uh, stones in it and irrigation, drip irrigation into it, and I produced uh, tomatoes in, in that way as well. And uh, what I did, of course, we have some old tomatoes that uh, become supermen with three balls, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> this one has four. Uh, of course, we uh, encounter some very cold climates. Uh, I don't know what happened here. but. Uh, we go as low as 13 degrees. But uh, then I, I'm, I'm a guy who always explores. I do a lot of experiments. I learn through making a lot of uh, stuff up and all that because it stays with you, you know. So I always, my, my staff get very uh, annoyed when I come back with different ideas because they have to throw one set of ideas away and do another one. Um, I have no idea how to put PowerPoints together, so I woke my daughter up this morning to say, can you do my PowerPoint? Ah, no sleep. So I, I got all the photos to the IT department and they put something together. So I hope you don't mind if it's in different sequence because <laughs> uh, this is how it gets in winter. It gets very cold and of course for sanity I go back to the drawing board and design how to do a, um, uh, do a greenhouse. So uh, in between, the former Governor General of New Zealand walks in because uh, his, his father was from my village. So, uh, and, and the guy on his right uh, was his childhood friend who spent about 22 years with him in, in Wellington. So uh, two weeks later, the, my uncle, who was white shed, died. So I had to call the Governor General. And in between, I do a bit of private jobs to earn some money. And some of the things you face with tomatoes, you have all those sorts of uh, sites where the, f uh, the wires, the ropes rub against each, each other. They produce all those things. And one after my first crop, the second crop, I encountered this disease called uh, nematodes. And they, the roots no longer are able to take any nutrients up the tree, so the roots start swelling like elephantiasis or whatever it's called. So then I decided this is not the way I'm going to run the uh, grow tomatoes. So I went into growing tomatoes in coconut husk in pot plants. And this photo is there just to let you know we have to go back to ancient times because I, could, I cannot drive my tractor in the greenhouse. And uh, occasionally we have to do things. Of course, we have some water problems. I got an old uh, Datsun van, removed everything, put in a pump in the drive shaft, so we go to the river and pump the water. Uh, some views from my farm. And of course, uh, after hard day's work, people come to drink grog. And then this poor rooster has no idea, he's only got 15 minutes in the universe <laughs> to go. So he was in the pot within half an hour. Only if they knew, the poor guy would have run for his life. I, I do a lot of things in the village. I, I designed this stove so that we can use fire. And then there was an old lady <laughs> who, who had problems going to the toilet, so I had to explain to my wife I need a new chair. So these are things you do to help the society or the community. And then I had to explain to my daughter why I used her cotton doll. So I shoved it in a cement mixture and created a sculpture, which is, and then I put it in front of the gate. I saw in Facebook how they, there's one way of growing um, um, sugar cane. So I tried it, just for sake of trying it, and it grew, it, and right now it is about six feet tall. Now, then of course I got a, a biogas system using um, a toilet waste, goes into the system, it produces fertilizer, and then we pump it into the farm. And that is one of the greenhouses. And then this is uh, um, tomatoes on the ground. And of course, you come across with these sort of uh, abnormalities and diseases. 
and they actually are exactly from the book, and we experienced all those. And then I made a fish pond where I got tilapia, malaya. I used the fish uh, manure water run into the tomato system with all these gadgets around the place, and I grew fish water into the stone fill uh, containers, and I grew vegetables in it as well. That's broccoli. Uh, of course, I tried, uh, I dug a trench with plastic uh, uh, underlay and put stones in it. I ran fish uh, water into it, and I got some tomatoes. And then uh, we've set up a, a, a model thing for farmers to see how we can use drip irrigation to produce vegetables. So, and then, of course, when you have fish, you have to produce a bit of oxygen or aerate the water, so I designed this windmill. And in a, a very windy day, two of the blades were lying 100 meters in somebody else's farm. So we had to change our strategy and and then I went into hydroponics. I set up few NFTs and started growing things hydroponically. Uh, and and, and um, produce lettuce. It's a, a solar power pump, and we have a seedlings nursery. We are produce our own seedlings. Uh, these are some lettuce, and we also grow lettuce in um, in stone. Actually, actually. These trays here have river pebbles, 12 one inch size river pebbles, and we grow uh, lettuce in it. And then we also tried coriander on the right hand side, and then we started growing in coconut husk. We brought this coconut dust from uh, Pacific Green. Uh, why does it keep going back now? So we had to boil it, sterilize it, dry it, and then put them into coconut uh, on these plastic bags and put in. What we've also done is we have now gone away from manual watering into drip irrigation, which is fully computerized. Each plant has its own drip system, and it's programmed so that uh, you, know, you get water and fertilizer uh, uh, automatically. Uh, just to let you know, I'm deaf, so I wouldn't be able to hear your lolly. So when we, <laughs> so it's a sign of good, good seedlings when you see the roots uh, curling around each. Uh, and then when the seedlings are grown, it is, it's got its own uh, watering system, which is like a, a fork spray. And then this is the system which controls all the tomatoes and all that. Uh, we also have a biogas uh, digester, which we put all our kitchen waste in it. And on one side, in the yellow container, we have fertilizer, which we put into the fertilizer distribution for the tomato. And on the other end, we get gas. So the gas is uh, actually goes up to a stove up there. So I cook in that. And it's got no smell, nothing. So this is the f just a mere sort of a view of the farm uh, from the hill on the opposite side. And there are two very long greenhouses, and then of course all the other things. Um, and that's that's the farm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adish. And uh, if I could invite our four panelists just to come back to the table now. Um, we just have a, a few minutes for some questions. Um, so if uh, folks, if you could just come back. Um, but I certainly like uh, when someone says I'm a farmer and I used to do a bit of, a, a bit of architecture. I did the GPH and I did Tabu City um, and a few other iconic buildings. Um, it's... Uh, very modest. Um, so we've got, uh, I, I estimate, um, you know, 10, 12 minutes left uh, for questions from the floor. Um, we have a, uh, Lauren's got a mic here. Um, so let's just open the bidding. 
and see if we can, uh, if anybody would like to ask questions of either individual panelist member or of the panel as a whole. Sound. Uh, yeah, thanks. My name is Joe. Uh, I'm speaking as a landowner engaging in uh, ecotourism business. Um, the tourism industry has been valued at almost $2 billion now. And um, at the same time, the finan financial sector exposure to, that, uh, to the tourism industry is almost about the same. Um, so, so it means that uh, most of the resorts and uh, uh, hotels are operating in debt. Instead of bringing in fresh money, they've become a burden on the economy. You mentioned the Asian financial crisis and the U.S. recession having a negative growth, a negative impact on growth. And uh, right now, there's a lot of talk about liquidity uh, in the financial system. Uh, I know for a fact that some banks have uh, put a limit on customer withdrawals, wh while others have uh, shut down their um, branch operations in rural areas. So since the tourism industry is, is the main uh, income, and I'm just wondering what mechanisms do you think or should be put in place uh, when these new paradigms are encroaching the industry uh, to make it sustainable so that it can be an effective contributor to meeting the sustainable development goals? Okay, so we've got the fir first question is, uh, what needs to be done to make the tourist sector more sustainable uh, going forward? I'm gonna start, I think, with Rukmini. Uh, thank you for that question. I think it is quite important. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to talk on that ecotourism, although I had a slide there. But I think it is one of those areas where I think the government should put resources into ecotourism. Particularly, this is where now most of the interests for the ecotourism are. And so, to first of all, some of the mechanisms to attract more people to come in a sustainable manner to get into the ecotourism, uh, one should advertise as strongly as possible, particularly at the village level, uh, if we have internet and you know get them to go for the walks along with small numbers into that. So these are some of the things that can be easily, not easily, but taken into consideration to, to provide uh, ecotourism with culturally uh, ground food. I think the tomatoes would be one of them. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, these are some of those factors which can be taken into consideration for hydroponic, uh, not even hydroponic, but organic food and all that. These are some of those in things which even the youngsters are moving towards uh, the ecotourism to get into that. But I think the government should also uh, play a major role when they advertise uh, in terms of big hotels in Dinarau and others, but they also t talk a bit more about this ecotourism and the rural sector economy which can benefit. And, and I think this is a rural sector that can contribute quite a bit more from tourism perspective. A and the role of agriculture should be also linked with the tourism sector, uh, the hotels should be provided by with the local commodities rather than having tin pear and uh, and uh, peaches uh, opened up. Uh, why don't we put our bananas? Why don't we put our uh, papaya, <coughs> white, uh, popos, or oranges, or mandarins, and all that? I mean, I stayed at the Tanwa Hotel for of the moment, but while they have this uh, popo and a uh, bit of uh, pineapple, but they also have a can of. Uh, and, and so I'm thinking, why are we doing this? There is, there's really no need for us to have that. And <coughs> this morning when I went with uh, just the papaya and the pineapple and somebody mentioned to me, a Rose's wife mentioned to me, this is what you want to eat. And I can see your plate is more than anything else. So I think those sort of linkages are absolutely important. Debt is an issue. We, when we borrow, there is always that case of whether we are able to pay back. So I think these are some of the issues which uh, the banks, the loan officers, and even the small, um, so not, not so, even micro, small, medium enterprises should be assisted by the government in terms of adver uh, advising what sort of loans, how the re repayment uh, rates, and all of those things needs to be sorted out. And so that's one way of looking at it, but I'm happy to go a bit more detail with that later. Sanu? Well, uh, I would just agree with uh, what uh, Rukmani has to say. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, I, I mean, I think one of the things we've struck is that uh, we've all been talking about the need for private sector development, but we're all coming from the public sector. We've got somebody here from the private sector. Uh, do you want to talk, say a little bit how you think the uh, tourist sector could be made more, more viable, more sustainable from your perspective as a farmer? It's a bloody tough question. <laughs> you know, tourist resorts, they import a lot of vegetables every year. I think it's purely in vegetables about 70 million. And, uh, you know, the, the, the government should be assisting farmers. The Minister of Agriculture came to my farm once, and of course we know Dr. Main Reddy, and then he says that uh, I'm a hobby farmer. Now if you see what I've done, and if I've supplied 200 kgs of tomatoes to New Wall, it's not a fucking hobby. <laughs> it's a hard work. I'm sorry to say that that's the language you use in building industry and in the farm as well. Otherwise the horse don't move. So. We need to start producing locally produced vegetables, of course, uh, and target uh, uh, the tourism uh, uh, sector. Because tourism, tourist uh, resorts need quality, they need us to be consistent, and uh, it has to be of certain uh, uh, quality, of course. These are the things that we need to do, and there has to be some emphasis on farmers, or encouragement, or entice farmers to do that. Now. What I have done, not all farmers can do, uh, it's understandable because it, it, it takes, it costs a bit of money to set up those things. But eventually, you know, uh, I've learned a lot through YouTube. And of course, walked into my farm, an Israeli guy. And of course, when you talk about agriculture, Israel, you know, is pretty top in the ranks. And he taught me how to water vegetables. You know, before we water, we take a hose and spray the thing all over the place. You don't do that. You actually should never spray water on the leaves. You should actually put water on the roots. So the drip system was the best, and it produces the best fruits, and grass doesn't grow. Uh, I'm probably deterring from what the actual question was. The question is that we need to support the farmers to produce quality vegetables so that we can support the tourism industry. And uh, there is a, uh, a small farm set up for Sheraton in Dendro Island where they produce their own herbs and little things. So it, those sort of things should be encouraged in all resorts so they can employ people to do these things. So, so there has to be more emphasis on farming, really. Farming is the next best thing. Uh, I think, uh, you know, forget about sugar. Uh, it's probably politically wrong for me to mention that, but... but uh, we need to actually emphasize how we can take farming to replace any other major economic uh, contributor. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, when Adish says it's not an effing hobby, he's not swearing, that's a technical farming term. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Janesh, do you have any views on making, making tourism more sustainable or more uh, viable? Well, I think um, he's right in the sense that we need to support the farmers. And what's more important is to provide the necessary training to the farmers so we are able to produce vegetables at a much lower cost and at, at a large scale. So that's quite important, but that's going to take a lot of hard work on the policy side. And it's going to require years and years of work before we are able to produce vegetables uh, at low cost. Well, I've got the mic, you don't have the public forum to speak too often, but hopefully this message gets to the ministers. You know, I've seen ministers and permanent secretaries travel to each part of the world attending conferences on agriculture, or especially agriculture. I think what they need to do, pick 10 farmers from one town, you know, real farmers, who actually do the work. Send them to those places and conferences, and, and, and they'll see firsthand what they do. And when they come back, they actually apply the same technology or idea or concept. And, and those are the ways it will improve. If the minister goes, he comes back, he doesn't go to the farm and you know, <laughs> use that. So maybe that's one way of upskilling our farmers. Send the actual people who actually do the job. Um, it's lucky for me, I've traveled a lot of places. 
you see by experience and, and you know you can replicate and duplicate and all those things but we need to like uh, uh, Janesh has said need to give more knowledge to our farmers you know people are in my area people are still doing growing things the way they used to grow 80 years ago and they're still doing the same thing you know year in year out when there's tomato season they all grow tomatoes and there's bacon bean whatever they do the same thing so you know you you have the same supply in the market season after season so i'm i'm trying to do things so i can grow things in off season so there's more money in off season so and there's you know uh, consist consistency of supply in the market. So if you upskill the farmer and, and provide finance for they can, so they can have greenhouses and irrigation system, it's all about water management. You know, you, 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 if you manage your water properly, your plants will grow properly and be healthier. It doesn't mean you, you give a gallon of water to a plant, he'll be okay for the next one month. But you can give it slowly. You know, and that's one thing I learned in drip irrigation. Now we're pretty close to time, so okay. we'll probably just take one more question. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, we're done here. Okay, we'll just, I'm afraid we'll just have one more because I've been warned to let you go at three o'clock for uh, tea. Uh, thank you. Joe uh, Ngonewa, you from the School of Governance? I'd just like to ask uh, from uh, Mrs. Ganda about the spillover. I would like to know if also you have also in your included in your research about the negative uh, spillover in relating to uh, about the tourism from the what we are facing in Fiji about the trans, uh, transnational crime, uh, the lack of uh, price uh, transferable, the benefit of uh, tourism earnings to our nations. And it's uh, we all are understanding now that a lot of earnings have been earned from overseas and not been transferred uh, to our economic and also the about the, the emphasis over emphasizing of gender inequality that has a uh, weak in our family base we also have that understanding that uh, strong family develops strong nations and now we have uh, the, having that uh, repercussions of having the daily news of a uh, lot of delinquency activities happening for our children of the lack of supervision because of the overemphasizing of the gender equality. And secondly, for Kumar, uh, Sunil Kumar, do you think that the overregulation, uh, over overregulated uh, economic environment that we have is the killing or the poison, uh, killing uh, the passions of uh, being involved in uh, business, or is it a killing bug of developing our economy? in the local scene. Uh, for Janice, I have, uh, I just having these uh, uh, issues about when you said, when we borrow more internationally, it makes our economic vulnerable without mentioning about over borrowing locally from our piggy bank, which is our FNPF. Does it make our people more vulnerable? Uh, and also, there's a lack of uh, emphasizing of about the scrutiny of the military expenses that has an impact in our GDP. Because over five years, I think we have spent more than one billion dollar. And how much do we earn or the benefit? Because we hardly have uh, any statistics from the UN. How much do we earn from the UN by spending uh, more than a billion dollar within five years? for our military. And secondly, I will just uh, read about uh, uh, the questions about being raised on a lot of dictators around the world where they manipulate data for their benefits. Do you think that our data is more, uh, is, uh, can you trust the data that has been given uh, to us by our agencies? that has also has been giving us all the positivity. But we have seen in the grassroots the, the opposite of it. 
And uh, do you think also, for when you said uh, about the 200 million investigation of the FSE, do you think that 15 years later, does it make sense to make an investigation when we could have in the law the time limit that we could have spent another million dollar trying to investigate a 200 million dollar uh, investigation that will go nowhere at all? Thank you. Okay, you can see my natural authority as a vice chancellor. When I said one more question, we had about five there. Um, I think, in due, uh, view of the time, uh, appreciate that there's a number of questions you've raised there. I think possibly just a, one quick comment from each of the panelists in response to those questions, uh, and then we'll have to break for tea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, uh, Joe. My, your question to me is whether the overregulation is killing the private sector. Uh, that's true. Uh, that's, I, I've shown it in the you know business environment uh, data that uh, you know the uh, business environment has worsened, and basically it's about regulations. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, we can live with the regulations that are there, but the procedures have to be made you know you know much more leaner than what it is. People who have you know lesser access to offices and all that. Uh, have serious difficulty in getting those, you know, meeting those regulations. And that is where, you know, the uh, compliance cost comes in, which really is a killer to these small businesses. Uh, say, for instance, a small business of, you know, three or four people, uh, three or four, you know, workers will have to actually hire an accountant to deal with those. And it's very costly. So that, that, that those are the kinds of things the government has to look at. Thank you. I'll start with the uh, positive side of the spillover effect of uh, tourism. Tourism is an industry which is large enough to employ enough people to have a business runs uh, which contributes to the economy. Business is linked to various uh, uh, indicators of how the economic side, the social side can be tied in together uh, in terms of uh, international foreign exchange earning, the export sector, these are some of the positive perspective that any economy, it doesn't have to be whether it's a small economy like Fiji or whether it's a big economy like China or Japan or US, uh, tourism still plays a very important role because it contributes to bringing in that export sector with other linkages, uh, with other um, in, in, uh, agriculture sector, manufacturing sector and service sector as well which are linked together to increase some sort of income uh, generating for the economy, for the people, and up to the grassroots level as well, which brings them a bit of more uh, perspective of uh, uh, earning uh, a decent, uh, getting a decent job. Negative perspective, one of that uh, is always linked to climate change, uh, particularly in terms of our oceans, in terms of our whether we are taking away our agriculture sector, or agriculture is getting smaller, and of course the other sector, uh, building hotels and things of that nature, what is the impact on our waters, on our food, even our culture itself is also affected. We try to uh, emulate what is externally induced to us, but how we adapt that and link it is what is our choice. So culturally, we can think from that perspective as well. Uh, you briefly talked about gender inequality. Gender inequality is such an issue uh, which basically uh, is everywhere and how that, uh, when I say it's an international issue, and so it has become a part of the Sustainable Development Goal. And to address that, do we want to address their jobs, Family, no doubt, is the most important. Culturally, we all tie in together, family chips in, whether it is at the village level, uh, rural sector, or even at the urban household. But these are some of the things which we have to work out ourselves to see how we educate our children, what sort of ethics we want to talk to them about from our culture perspective to keep that unity. Uh, but at the same time, if you want them to work, uh, better education, better wage rate, better choices in the long run in terms of food, uh, health, education, and all this will be integrated together to make sure that we improve gender equality. But we have to make sure that the youth and particularly also the women are in forefront in making this decision making so that 
if there are some decisions to be taken by the head of the household, they are aware what, why those uh, decisions are made for whose benefit. So there are pros and cons, but I think education, health, all of these issues are very important. And with better education, better informed messages are to the youngsters today to take this into account. And culturally, that's how we cultivate ourselves. Thank you. Karanaka. And Janish, last, last word to you. Do you believe the numbers? Um, well, I don't think uh, there's any obvious reason, uh, evidence before the public that the number seems to be manipulated. However, I must say the government should provide data on private investment separately from data pro, uh, on investment by public enterprises so we can see a very clear trend as to what's happening to private investment. That's what we are more interested in. You mentioned about $200 million loss investigation. I think that's a good step by the government. It doesn't matter it was done in 2004 or 1990 or whichever it is. We need to take loss that uh, in institutions where the government has a stake more seriously. And the onus is on the government to actually live up to this particular um, um, decision that they've made to investigate. And I would expect that the government would have a similar kind of approach in all other institutions where the government has a stake. Okay? There are some state enterprises that may have lost. The government needs to investigate those as well. So the taxpayers know how their money has been spent and where are the areas that the government needs to improve as far as spending is concerned. We cannot only rely on the government to spend. And the government needs to be more careful about its spending. And that's going to happen when the government clearly identify why losses are taking place. Um, you also talked about uh, um, borrowing, domestic borrowing and external borrowing. Uh, generally, uh, external borrowing becomes more problematic for small developing economies. But at present, the share of external debt to GDP ratio is below 15%. And that rise has happened after 2013. So external debt is not an issue right now. But the level of external debt has increased. The problem with rising external debt is that it limits our response. It restricts our ability to respond to adverse external shocks. Uh, if you borrow in US dollars, okay, and something happens to the exchange rate, we as a small economy will be adversely affected. So for small development economies, ideally we'd want to keep a very low uh, level of external debt. The government targets a 70, 30 percentage. It's still below that 30 percent. So we are good there. Okay? Now, domestic borrowing is not so problematic, provided it doesn't crowd out private investment. And that's what I'm saying. We need data on private investment. So we can actually see what's happening to private investment. And having data on private investment will allow us to test the impact of public debt on private investment. Few years ago, I can click clearly recall, the government used to provide data on private investment. Recently, they've messed the two. So we can't really follow what's happening to private investment, okay? Whether that increase in investment is coming from private sector or is it coming from private enterprises? We need to encourage private sector investment. And the government is putting policies on the ground and the onus is in the government to be able to monitor it. And that's what we would want to see as well. All right, we're just one 30 second. Yes. Um, just my last word on, um, on data manipulation. Uh, I beg to disagree with uh, Janesh on that. Um, in my perspective, after talking to many people out there in the Bureau of States and so on, um, I think there's some degree of manipulation happening. Um, the very fact that Bureau of Statistics falls under the um, Ministry of Economy, uh, there is there is a lot of you know supervisory you know interventions um, uh, on the Bureau of States. So that's a problem, and that is why we see lots of you know data variations. So we might have to fix it, and I think there's a big question that the government itself will have to, and international agencies need to, IMF uh, for sure, needs to uh, come to, uh, you know, question that issue uh, with the government. Thank you. Okay, we started a lot of different conversations going there, so uh, these can continue over uh, afternoon tea. I'd like to thank everybody for coming along to this, uh, to this session, which has been very wide-ranging and raised a number of issues. 
Um, and I'd just like to finish by uh, asking you all to uh, join me in giving a big hand for our panel. <laughs>